Hi everybody, welcome to Dynamo Sword Channel. I'm David and today on Dynamo Sword Channel I will be reviewing the Balor Arms 13th to 14th century long sword. Now if you're not familiar with Balor Arms, they're a fairly new manufacturer in the sword industry from India. Their small product line consists of medieval arming and long swords of the 12 and 18 blade types. A few highlights to their swords is their blades, which are made of uh, 5160 high carbon steel. Uh, they do have a peened hilt construction and also feature a wood core scabbard. For the price, they seem pretty impressive. So compared to other budget sub $300 sword manufacturers like Windless, Hanway, or even Topeka, how do they hold up? Well, stay tuned and we will find out today. The Balor Arms 13th to 14th century longsword is what would be described as a Type 12A in the Oakshot typology. A Type 12A is a subtype of the Type 12 blade type that seems to have been developed in the early 13th century. The Type 12A is a special sword as it was the first type of two-handed longsword, or more specifically war sword, to be used in medieval Europe. Now, you may be asking what is a war sword compared to a longsword? Well, technically they're about the same, though what sets them apart is a war sword is more of a description for a hand and a half or two-handed sword um, that would set more into the group one of Oakshot's typology, consisting of cut-focused, lenticular cross-section blades. It's nothing really to get stuck on, but it is a more simpler way to describe an earlier period longsword. The Type 12A was developed as a sword to be used with two hands, allowing more leverage and reach to be given to the wielder. This proved beneficial to the man-at-arms on foot as it allowed uh, not only reach to uh, a man on horseback, but also powerful two-handed cuts and thrusts to those on field. It seems the war sword types were developed in Germany, but quickly gained popularity throughout Europe and even were uh, seen during the uh, Crusades in the Middle East. The Type 12A, much like its core type, the 12, had a very versatile blade profile. It was broad and fuller to benefit devastating cuts, but also featured a more tapering blade profile, allowing for very effective thrusting capability. Now, it doesn't have the... Um, you know, cross sections and finer acute points of later uh, period blades. Though this was clearly the design that set the foundation for those, the future development of those later period cut and thrust long swords. Now this Balor arm sword is a fine representation of a typical Type 12A war sword of the 13th to 14th centuries as its name suggests, featuring the simpler cruciform hilt popular at the time. It features a blade true to the type with its long fuller and broad, acutely tapering profile blade. The grip is of adequate length for the type as well, neither being too long or too short. The polish of the blade and guard and pommel is a nice satin and the blade is properly peened to the tank. So next, we'll take some full looks at the full statistics of the sword. The overall length of the sword is 44 and 3 quarters inches. It has a weight of 2.5 pounds. The point of balance is right at about 7.5 inches from the guard, with the center per of percussion being about 23.5 inches from the guard, so just right here towards the uh, tip of the blade. The blade class, again, would uh, be considered a long sword, or more specifically, as we discussed earlier, a war sword. Now, the blade length is 36 inches. The blade width is right at 2 inches, and the blade material is a uh, high carbon steel, uh, with its steel grade being 5160. The cross section does have a more production styled flat diamond as opposed to a more lenticular cross section that you would see on a more historical blade, but it is fully fullered 
and that fuller goes down to about seven eighths of the blade length. The blade type is, as we mentioned earlier, a type 12A in the oak shot typology. Now, the guard length is seven and five eighths inches long from quillion to quillion. The quillion dimensions on the inside is about a half inch and that slowly tapers down, um, you know, maybe to about an eighth of an inch. Um, the width of the guard is right at about uh, three eighths at its widest and that tapers down to about half an inch towards uh, the middle. Uh, the material is a mild steel, again in a satin finish similar to the blade, and then its style is the curving oak shot type six guard. Um, these were really nice um, because you know they they fit that cruciform hilt, but they also kind of with the up curve and the wider point added a little more protection to the wrist and the grip when in motion. Now the handle total length is seven inches with the circumference being three and three eighths at the base here at the guard tapering down to about three inches um, at the pommel. The handle material is a nice hardwood and the grip material is a nice black leather with risers. Now this is definitely one of the highlights of the Baldo Arm swords as they do come with really nice well done grip wraps. As some of you might know who have watched uh, my previous videos, I tend to customize and re-grip my handles on my swords. Um, and this one honestly is up to par in my opinion. Um, I don't really think I'll, honestly unless I wanted to change the color of it, really have to uh, change the grip because it's really well done, really well executed, and very impressed. This is definitely one of the highlights of the uh, Ballo Arms line is their grip wraps. Now, onto the pommel. The pommel's length is 1 and 5 eighths inches. The pommel circumference from each side of the grip is 4 and a quarter inches. The material, like the guard, is a mild steel with a satin finish. And as you can see, it does have a peened construction. Now, the peen is done pretty well. Um, you know, it's not as fine as more higher end swords where they blend it in and you don't really notice it. Um, so it's rough on that side, but it seems to be really well done. Um, it's not loose. They did a really good job at it. The pommel's nice and tight, the guard's nice and tight, so there wasn't any movement or anything in use. Um, the other benefit is um, I'm not 100% sure, you know, if it's keyed. Uh, the pommel is keyed to the tang or not. If it is, excellent. That's another really highlight that it would be nice to see in the sub-300 price point. But I'm not really going to hold my breath on that. I don't really want to deconstruct the sword to see. But, um, you know, maybe we can get in contact with the manufacturer and see what they say about that. So next, let's have a look at the scabbard. Overall, it comes with a pretty decent wood core scabbard. It has a nice soft leather over wrap that is stitched and features risers set in place for a frog or a belt suspension system or carry. Um, unfortunately, as with most of the um, scabbards in the budget range, it's not really great in regards to fit and finish. One of the big faults to it is its actual fit. It is very loose. It rattles and has no friction fit whatsoever. You can literally just bounce it out. And that's disappointing because it definitely drops the overall um, kind of just carry of the sword. You don't really want it falling out. You don't want to bend over and have your sword fall out. Um, if you're sitting around and just holding it, it is nice just to house it, especially if the blade is sharp. But again, it is 
disappointing that it doesn't have as well as a fit as I would think. Um, not really hard to remedy though. With it being wood core, you could always shim it. As you can see here, just putting some shim similar to what um, uh, Katana users do. You know, you just shim the top and that will keep that friction fit, keep it from at least falling and sliding out. Um, it won't help anything with the rattle. You'd have to maybe line the scabbard, and, which is going to be dissembling. Is it worth it with a budget scabbard? Probably not. But again, this is a budget scabbard, so you can't really expect too much out of it. Again, it's hard to complain, you know, as they are better than nothing, but um, they don't seem to add much to the overall um, package of the sword. Uh, I wouldn't think that pricing, if they remove these, that the price would be less. I think they're just kind of an a add-on. Um, overall, with its finish, it is a nice looking scabbard. It does have a nice finish to it. The leather, and the stitching and everything has a nice metal shape with a satin finish to match the sword. So as a package, overall I'd say it's decent, but unfortunately just the fit is just subpar. So in conclusion, what do I think of this sword and its manufacturer? Honestly, I was pleasantly surprised by Valor Arms. The attention to detail and general fit and finish for the price point was actually quite good. I mean, for only $200, you're getting a pretty accurate replica of a sword of decent weight and proportions to a historical original. I mean, sure, there are some shortcomings which are to be expected at the price point, but overall, um, you know, it seems to be pretty decent for the price. You know, one issue some find with the swords is they tend to be a little too whippy. Now, every sword with moderate distal taper will have some amount of flex or whip to it, you know, especially those with flatter cross sections. But as some have discussed online, many of the Balorarm swords um, did have issues with over flexibility as well as twists or, billet or bends in the blade. Now, these are normally manufacturing issues, forging issues, and it's just run of the mill for general production. And, you know, they're not exclusive. It's not like any other vendor doesn't have these issues either, even in the higher ends when it comes to mass production. Um, one benefit, though, is, is the vendor of Balor Arms, Cult of Athena, noticed this and placed much of the stock on a second quality listing um, for those such swords having blade defects. So they were offered for, I think, uh, $100 and, you know, they were still considered functional. The heat treatment things were good. But overall, just a few slight bends, twists, and then sometimes the over flexibility was an issue. Now with mine, um, kind of, it does have movement to it, but it is nowhere. I mean, I've literally seen people take these swords and really just almost bend them when they swing them. Mine does have flexibility. You know, it doesn't have really any sag to the blade itself when you're in movement um, but yeah overall it is flexible is it overly flexible I wouldn't say it is I've owned Hanway Tinker models that had way more whippiness and blade flexibility to it and that brings another issue with the 5160 steel perhaps when it is set with such a distal taper for example like these Balor arms and um, Hanway Tinker swords are Perhaps they're just getting a little too thin, and um, they're just that just makes them whip. It's hard to say. Now, a few other issues that I noticed that are not necessarily detrimental to the form or function of the sword were stains on the bladed hilt. Now, these seem to be from whatever packing oils uh, they use for the swords, and, and when they're shipped, and when it dries, it actually becomes quite sticky and stains the, um, the sword, the metal parts. Um, with that, I don't know, it, it kind of depends on, I guess, how soon your sword ships out, how long it's been in stock at the vendor, um, obviously climate control of their warehouse and things like that. Uh, it seems like perhaps, you know, a suggestion could be given to the manufacturer to um, you know, grease or, or oil their blades and something different because it is a little unfortunate. 
I mean, it wasn't hard to remedy um, a little. I use flits, metal polish um, on all my swords. It's my preferred product. And uh, it cleaned it up pretty well. Um, some of the more stickier spots, I did have to take some, you know, high grip paper and, you know, kind of work it, work it off. But for the most part, it wasn't a really big issue. Um, you know, the grip, as I mentioned, which is very impressive, wrapped really well, did have a few little flaws too. Um, I've read this online too that the uh, grips tend to uh, have excess glue um, to where they just didn't, it seems like they were a little sloppy in regards to the finish and didn't really clean up the glue. Um, so you'd have excess glue, you know, sitting out of the seams or, you know, around the guard or pommel. Mine had that as well. Um, whatever uh, glue they use is a, you know, kind of more rubber uh, soluble epoxy. So it was easy to clean up, just kind of pick and peel off. It didn't actually stick to the metal or stain the metal, which was nice. Um, but again, it was just one of those issues that um, in regards to fit and finish, you kind of don't like to see at any price point. But again, not something that really is detrimental to the actual function of the sword. As far as my thoughts on Balor Arms as a manufacturer, I'm very happy to see another sub $300 manufacturer of medieval European swords. And they do seem to be getting better as time go goes on and um, they start adding these little upgrades I've seen to their product line as new stock comes in. Uh, you know, they also upgraded their steel grade. Um, they went from EN45 up to 5160, which is a nice improvement, as well as just the general finish and profile geometry of their blades. Um, you know, a few of those is, you know, just weight, uh, distal taper, and things like that really have improved in the time um, that I've seen them introduced to the sword market by Cult of Athena and to now with the more recent um, stock models. Now one um, kind of minor issue is, is that um, their product list is relatively small. They don't have a lot of swords available or variety of swords available. Uh, you know, that's just part of being new, I guess, but I would definitely like to see, um, you know, more types, uh, blade types, or just swords in general from them. Uh, they seem to be a very, um, you know, good manufacturer, and I would definitely like to see more swords from them. Um, as of now, their product line consists of this uh, Type 12A long sword. They also have uh, a variant of this one with a different guard called the 14th Century long sword, but it does have the same pommel and blade. They also have a 12 arming sword as well as uh, two 18 uh, model swords. Uh, they have a Type 18 uh, called the 15th Century Arming Sword, and then they also have their 18A long sword um, that is actually based off of the uh, Bresca Spadona um, sword of, you know, kind of more historical renown. Um, so, honestly, definitely I would recommend Balor Arms. I think they do offer a good product. Um, very comparable to anything from Windless or Hanway, I would say. I believe they're a step up above Topeka. And again, for $200, I don't think you can really go wrong. Um, definitely offer a very quality product. A few things I'd like to see them work on is definitely fit and finish uh, as far as quality control. And then, of course, maybe, you know, getting those scabbards a little more fit to the blade. Um, well... That's going to be it for the review of the Balor Arms uh, 13th to 14th century longsword. Um, be sure to check out the following uh, cutting review. So I will do a follow-up review on this. It will be released shortly after where I do some cutting, put it through its paces, as well as give some final thoughts and feedback on its performance as a cutting weapon. But until then, thanks for watching. Please like and comment, um, subscribe, and We'll see you next time on Dynamo Sword Channel.